Bang, bang. What's going on, guys? Hope you guys are really excited about this interview. I really enjoyed it. I think you will as well. But before we get into that, make sure that you like this video so that more people on YouTube can find it. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And don't forget that BlockFi is the sponsor today. They've got three products. You can buy and sell crypto on their crypto exchange. You can deposit crypto and earn up to 8.6% APY in an interest-bearing account. Or you can deposit crypto and take out a US dollar loan against your crypto collateral. You can use the description right here, or you can go to BlockFi.com slash POMP to learn more. All right, let's get into this episode. I hope you guys enjoy this one. All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Hani here with me. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. All right. Uh, what is going on in the world of institutional adoption of crypto in public markets? I feel like you are the maybe the world's expert on all of this. What's happening? Yeah, so um, we're based in Europe, so I can talk a lot about uh, institutional adoption there. That's where our products are um, registered, listed. That's where they get sold. Um, we have seen a lot of demand primarily from fund managers, independent asset managers, family offices, private banks. Uh, it's no longer just dipping their toes in. We see people talking about allocating 10, 20, 30 million dollars across a number of different strategies. Um, Bitcoin is sometimes the gateway into all of this. Sometimes it's not. And so we've had uh, people come in on uh, smart contracts. We've had some people come in more recently with the Coinbase news on Binance and starting to see, well, the exchanges are actually printing cash. They're making real revenues. You can look at them as uh, defensible businesses with moats and all of that. And a bunch of people have come in and, and wanted to invest in, in those kinds of things. And so I think in terms of um, pension funds, insurance companies, like really big institutional guys, they're not in yet, uh, and, and it will be a while. Uh, we've had some conversations. They're, they're interested, but they're very slow moving, and it's, it's going to be, I think, a long time before they're really in. But yeah, um, asset managers, private banks, family offices, high net worth are all more than dipping their toes in. So let's talk about the business that you have, because you basically have kind of two sides of the business. Yeah. Uh, and I should say up front, I'm an investor, so I'm a big fan and obviously very long. Uh, one is Amun mm -hmm. and the other is 21 shares. What is the difference between those two? It's very simple. So we do ETPs, ETFs under 21 shares, and we do tokens under Amun. Okay. And when uh, you say ETPs, ETFs, I think most people know what an ETF is. What is an ETP? Uh, an ETP is basically what the Swiss call an exchange traded commodity, and it is it is what the Swiss specifically call it. Uh, sometimes you go across the border in Germany, and suddenly they want to call it an ETN, or sometimes you go elsewhere and they want to call it an ETC. Uh, in Europe, uh, as opposed to the United States, you cannot do an ETF on a single asset. Uh, ETFs have to, in order for them to be what's called USITS uh, compliant, they have to have a diversity requirement. And you have to have a number of elements in there. So you could do an index as an ETF, but you can do a single asset. And so in Europe, not even any of the commodities, silver, gold, et cetera, are done as ETFs. So it's impossible to do one there. On the 21 share side, talk through like just some of the products, right? So you have a Bitcoin ETP. Yeah. You have a ETH ETP. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What are some of the other assets? So we have 14 total products um, listed on the Swiss, German, and Austrian stock exchanges. Uh, you can buy them using dollars, francs, pounds, or euros. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum are uh, two very obviously popular products. The other 12 products include a bunch of single assets, some of which you can only purchase through our company, like Polkadot, which isn't available on a lot of exchanges, um, including Coinbase in Europe, um, or Coinbase globally, actually. Uh, so we have a Polkadot ETP, we have a Binance ETP, we have a Tezos uh, income generating staking ETP, stakes on your behalf, returns to you the dividends. Uh, and in addition to that, I think we have Ripple, Bitcoin Cash. We just released Stellar and Cardano last week. We also have the world's only indexes. So we have four indexes, uh, one made by us, three made by independent third parties, including the American company Bitwise, Signum, and Bitcoin Swiss. And we also have the world's only uh, listed Bitcoin short. So you can buy a product to hedge or um, make a bet on uh, the negative price action of Bitcoin just as easily as, as buying a share. So the 21 share side of the business, like how big is that from like an AUM standpoint? 
yeah, so things have escalated, I think, since we last chatted. We were doing, I, I would say, probably 20 million when we last chatted. We were 27 million about a year ago. Uh, we're now at $2 billion in total AUM. Uh, and if you look at the price movement in the last year, a lot of that isn't just the price increasing. A lot of that is bigger checks from family offices, private banks, mm -hmm. and a lot of retail interest in Europe as well. So $2 billion in assets across those 14 products. Yeah, in the last 12 months, yeah. Okay. Now, when you go and you look at the Amun side, you said that you do tokens. Explain the difference between the tokens and the uh, ETPs or ETFs. Sure. So um, ETPs, ETFs are very regulated financial products. Um, they're structured as securities. So in, in many ways, we take crypto and we securitize it in order for institutional um, and non-technical users to feel comfortable making a bet on the asset class. Um, tokens are on the exact opposite end of that. They're not securities. And they're listed in predominantly today ERC-20 format, uh, but we will soon um, list them in other formats as well. So you can imagine a Binance Smart Chain token, for example, or something built on uh, another platform. For us, we just want to provide products to access the crypto ecosystem uh, to users. And what we found is sometimes it's significantly easier for certain populations to buy tokens. Uh, and for certain strategies as well, sometimes they're better in token form. And so whatever it is we can do on the token side, we'll, we'll issue it there. Uh, whatever it is we can do on the ETP side, we'll do that. And there are sometimes overlaps. So we have both a BTC short token as well as a Bitcoin short ETP. And that's fine. How big is the Amun side? Like, and, and what is the interest you're seeing there? So the Amun side is unreleased. So we're about to launch the first four tokens in uh, about a month time. Uh, so we're launching with with a pretty cool partner. Um, haven't announced that yet publicly, but but you'll see it and it'll be cool. Um, and we're launching, we're going to have a plan of launching both um, uh, what, are, what we're calling autopilot tokens. So they will go, you buy a single ERC-20 token, and then it on your behalf goes and uh, generates yield optimizing rewards in some theme. So we're going to do that with liquidity uh, mining, and we're going to do that with lending. So if you want to optimize all the DeFi lending protocols, just buy this token, and it will optimize that programmatically, airdrop you the rewards uh, on, a, on a daily basis, on a regular basis. We're also going to launch a number of indexes. So if you would like to bet on the entire DeFi ecosystem, uh, that's going to be the first product. We're also going to launch a few more uh, interesting strategies there. So take like a DeFi index token. How do you determine what goes in, what doesn't go in? Is there rebalancing? Like, like just walk through the kind of the mechanisms of how one of these tokens would work where you're essentially buying like an index exposure, but you're doing it in token form. Yeah. So... Um, we take a look at a lot of things. In DeFi, we take a look at market cap and total value locked. Uh, we have certain um, tokens that we allow in. So we have the, you know, a committee that takes a look at this, makes sure that we respect the teams. We know the teams. We know who's behind them. We, we like the vision. We, we think this is um, worthy of, of inclusion. Uh, and that bit of it is a little bit subjective, just whether or not it is eligible to even be considered. But then after that, we, we take we take a hard look quantitatively at what the ecosystem looks like, um, how it how it uh, functions, how it's growing, and then we will do the weights there. Uh, rebalances regularly. I think the entire point is that uh, a lot of people believe in DeFi as a concept. They think it's going places. They think it's really um, quite innovative and interesting, and they would like to invest in it, but maybe not necessarily have the time to dive into the specifics. Um, it's sort of like betting on, I don't know, the Brazilian economy by buying a Brazilian index fund. Um, and what we want to do is we want to do that on um, these themes. So DeFi being the first one, but we'll also start thinking more about other themes as well as uh, more momentum driven things. So it's sometimes really, really difficult to see what is up and coming. We can programmatically do that, which should theoretically have give you easier access to uh, the new things that people don't necessarily know will be big yet. Um, and that that will be another way of, again, buying a single token, leaving it, setting it and forgetting it. And then it just does work on your behalf programmatically. What about actively managed 
tokens, right? So what I mean by that is obviously we've seen uh, people in the traditional world have a lot of success by uh, raising uh, ETF that's actively managed. Can you do that in the kind of crypto token world or is that not yet possible? I mean, you can you can do whatever you want. I think depending on the jurisdiction, um, sometimes there are regulatory issues with active management. Um, as a firm, we we sort of decided very, very early on that we're not really interested in active management. We're not interested in endorsing any specific product. Um, on the ETP side, all we look for is whether it's investable or not. Um, nothing more. It's not an endorsement. And on on the token side, our, our committees there are going to do something similar, where, again, we're, we're going to try and verify that these aren't scams, but beyond that, it's not an endorsement. What we believe our company should be doing is being a very neutral um, picks and shovels business, right? We want to give you the building blocks, the tools from which you can then go and using your ideas, your thoughts, uh, go about and you know invest or build out your strategy in some way that is professional institutional grade has the safeties you're not going to get robbed the fees are low etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but we're not going to jump in it and say we're gonna you know pick the winners or endorse this or endorse that when you think about in the ETF, ETP side, right, on the 21 shares, yeah. is the same thing true there as well in terms of uh, active management and just saying, hey, whether it's a token or an actual fund, uh, we're not going to have the active manager ourselves and we're also not going to endorse anyone? So 100%. Um, there are ways uh, of doing active management um, ETFs and ETPs. Obviously, there there are a couple of popular ones this year um, that have, you know, uh, come out and everyone is talking to them. I think it's important to realize that active management is really, really hard. It's sort of like venture capital. Um, we know the top winners and they do well, but the industry overall is oftentimes not having great returns. Active management's really, really difficult. And I would say that philosophically as a company, again, we're not really interested in active management. We're not interested in picking stocks or uh, we don't think we are smart enough to do that. Uh, we just want to build the tools from which others can then uh, use that. And so in the same way, we don't uh, endorse any specific product. We believe that it's investable. We don't think it's a scam. We believe the teams behind the products that we are launching believe in a vision, believe in a mission, are working towards it in a professional way. And beyond that, we don't do much else. Uh, we don't do small cap stuff on the ETP side. Um, and so it has to be above a certain threshold that that moves constantly, but guarantees as well that, especially on the ETP side, you're not investing in like brand new things. They they've they've matured a little bit. They've they've shown some staying power, um, and then we give you easier access to them. One of the people who appears to be smart enough to do active management is Kathy Wood. Uh, I know that you've done a bunch of stuff with her. Uh, including she's now personally invested in the business uh, and she's born, joined the board of directors. Maybe talk a little bit just about her, her yeah. involvement in the business and kind of how this all came together. Sure. So um, we, we've we always been huge fans of Kathy. Um, I mean, if you think about the, the business and 21 shares being the first thing we did, it's an ETF issuer on the 21 shares side. And um, Kathy's pretty big on in the ETF world, like before she hit the mainstream and was this huge figure that everyone knows now, um, she was still very, very, very um, much a big deal within the ETF world. So my co-founder ran into her at one of these um, exclusive ETF uh, product structurists uh, conference. They hit it off. We developed a relationship, chatted for a year or so. And then uh, there came a point where we uh, wanted to have an independent director on our board. Um, and so Kathy uh, ended up doing that. Um, in joining the board, as well as um, more recently, she also became an investor in the company. Um, and so super, super excited about that. Um, besides all of the things that we hear about um, on, on the Bitcoin and crypto side, like she, she started investing in Bitcoin in 2015 when it was $250, right? I, I think people really under um, value how big of a deal that is and how difficult it was to do that at the time, especially for an institutional um, fund manager on Wall Street. 
But besides that, what she's doing on genomics, what um, what she's doing with Tesla, what she's doing with all of the other products, this space exploration um, ETF that she just came out with, it's really, really innovative. And we're huge, huge fans of the shop. And we wanted to, you know, gather some knowledge um, on that. One of the things that is really um, important and um, near and dear to our hearts is research. Um, and so we believe really strongly that uh, we should build a brand that is trusted and we should educate everybody. Um, if you think about the internet was created in 1983, uh, it took a while for people to fully understand, maybe a decade later, then the boom and bust, then Web 2.0, then now we're starting to see the rewards. This is a generational thing. And, and it it's, um, as John Oliver uh, once said, crypto is everything you, uh, crypto is everything people don't know about finance and economics combined with everything they don't know about computer science and cryptography. And that Venn diagram is tough. And so we seek to elucidate all of that. And we seek to um, publish very deep research um, as well as very casual research. We do it in five languages now. We do it in Arabic, English, French, German, and Italian. Um, and in addition to that, we do podcasts. Uh, we print a quarterly magazine uh, for very institutional nice. investors. It's awesome. It looks great. Um, we should probably charge for it, but we, we give it away for free now. And for that kind of philosophy to then um, run into Kathy, where ARC is an acronym. I think it stands for Active Research Knowledge. Um, most people don't realize that, but but ARC is all about research driving these decisions. And Kathy's background is an equity research um, re, uh, as an equity research analyst um, had a lot to do with honestly her her big bets and her vision and how she's built the firm. So we also really overlapped there. And over the years, we've stolen a lot of how she's done research and and that kind of thing. And so it was very nice to start working together. What do you think makes her so great? Is it the research and just the constant like wanting to learn? Yeah, I think I think it's the when when you when you do research, it's it's scientific, it's not personal, it's not biased. There's not a huge, you know, selfish personality behind it. It's not egotistical. Um it's very fair, logical, scientific. And as a result, when you make big bets in that direction, then it's not personal and, and you reap the rewards. And I think a lot of people appreciate that. Wall Street is full of um, personalities that you know will come on TV and scream or have a certain, or scream on Twitter or you know have a certain sort of um, reputation where that sometimes is removed from how their firms are doing or what their investment strategies are, et cetera. And on her, uh, the first thing she did was uh, say that research should be open. All of these investment banks are super closed. They're super private. Um, they're charging so much for th this. We shouldn't do that. We should have very strong theses that we really uh, fundamentally believe in, and then we should share them with the world. And so you can go and see you know, an Excel spreadsheet of how they value Tesla um, and all of that broken down. And I think people really, really appreciate that. And then when you're right once, they appreciate it more. And then when you're right 17 times, <laughs> then maybe you're onto something. Yeah. When you think about uh, the operation that you have going in Europe, uh, a lot of the stuff that you have is not available in the United States today. That yeah. may change in the future. Uh, talk a little bit just about the difference that you see in the institutional investors and the family offices between Europe and the US. Are there material differences that you can identify? Or do you feel like an institutional investor is an institutional investor and so that there's really not that much to kind of call out there? Uh, yeah. They have the same... No, they have the same characteristics. Uh, oftentimes, the family office staff um, is recruited from from the same, uh, I guess, cut from the same cloth wherever you go. Uh, the interesting thing about Europe, actually, versus the United States and family offices, if I recall correctly, the average family office in the U.S. is much smaller. Like, mm -hmm. I think in America, people will set up family offices with 100 or 200 million of uh, liquid assets, whereas in Europe... The average to start is more like 500 million. And so you get sometimes the average, the median that you're speaking to is a larger organization. Got it. And do you think that that's like a cultural thing? Is that a, 
egotistical thing in the United <laughs> States of like people want to say they have a family office. Like what, what drives that? I mean, as um, as an American, I feel like it's it's a good spirit of um, I'm ready. I got this. I'll grow. I feel confident about this. Uh, who says that the limit for me to have this is 500? I think it's 100. I can do it. Uh, and I think there's a good spirit of Americanism actually in that. I appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just interesting that that's something that you notice, right? Is the size of the family offices are very different on the two different uh, geographies. Well, it's sort of like startups, right? Uh, one way of looking at it, and a lot of people, I think, make this mistake and do it, is like, I'm not ready yet to do a startup. I still need to go and have 10 years of work experience. And I need to also maybe get some experience on the investment side. And then, you know, you only want to start a startup when you're super well qualified to do one. Mm -hmm. And I think I would argue as a as a person that did his first company when he's 19, very rightly so, America will reward people that go out and try. Um, and you can try and fail, and failure is much more accepted in America than it is in Europe. Um, and as a result, I think people take bigger bets, mm -hmm. which is why, I again, it's the median, like the, the minimum is different in Europe, but obviously the wealth is much, 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 much greater in, in the U.S. Yeah. When you talk to regulators uh, kind of on different geographies, is there a change in tone or interest uh, or kind of receptiveness to this stuff as we've seen one prices go up, yeah. uh, but also two various institutions kind of over the last six to eight months, nine months uh, kind of come into the market and not only come into the market, but actually be public about their participation? Yeah, so talking about regulators is a is a, is a tricky subject, um, and I can't talk about any specific ones. Um, and you know, bef before I, sh I share some thoughts, you should know that we are speaking as of today with, I want to say, sixteen different regulators. So this mm -hmm. does not apply to any any specific one of them. Um, in my experience, um, the response can be varied, but at the end of the day. I haven't yet met a regulator that was personally motivated to bring something down or to champion something. Like, I don't think it's a crusade on, on any part. They're, in my humble experience, very technocratic folks whose sole mandate, or sometimes their biggest mandate and their biggest concern, is protecting end investors. That's really it. Um, all of that other stuff is a distraction. Like price action, Bitcoin increasing in price, I don't know that that really impacts anything be beyond, well, maybe the market is more uh, streamlined now such that the average retail investor won't lose everything in a scam by whales because the price action moved you know, so hard uh, in one way or another. So I don't, I, I, I don't think regulators are motivated by the same things that certainly investors or entrepreneurs are. Um, and it's actually my 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 personal opinion on this is that um, they tend to do a great job most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, we want to we want them to move faster, but of course we do because we we move at a ridiculous speed as startup founders. But at the end of the day, they're very well versed in this. Um, sometimes more than certain people in the industry, uh, and they're they're again. They're just trying to do their mandate of protecting the end investor. And if anything, regulation has gone um, pretty well. Like There is a good trend going in most of the countries that, that um, we've interacted with. Certainly, Europe is, is far ahead of, of the competition, but there are certain regulators that are moving in Asia. We're going to announce in the next quarter or so um, a Bitcoin ETF in, in Asia, in APAC. We're going to do one in the Middle East, um, and we're going to continue doubling down on, on Europe and other territories. And again, regulators are smart, receptive, um, and aren't being personally motivated. In sometimes you see some weird comments on there. It has nothing to do with their personal beliefs. Uh, they're very technocratic folks. Yeah, oh, it's gr it's good to hear that, right? It's a, po yeah, yeah. a positive for uh, for the industry, and frankly, a bullish tailwind. Um, when you think about recruiting, how has that changed? Is it now that everybody that works on That's Wall an Street, interesting subject, yeah. uh, or institutional investors, like, hey, I got to quit my job and I want to go and and work in this new industry? Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there still some lack of re receptivity in terms of uh, folks? Just like, what's changed there over the last maybe year or so? Yeah, so there's a lot of impact there from the price action. <laughs> um, and are they mad that everyone's <laughs> getting rich and they're not? 
yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people um, in the finance industry can speak very directly about how broken the finance industry is. And so a lot of the solutions, a lot of the problems that blockchain, Bitcoin, smart contracts, DeFi want to solve, seek to solve, um, they're very intimately aware uh, of those. And so that's that's pretty easy. However, from a job security standpoint, up until recently, it was a higher hurdle. But I would say at this point, we have never had an easier time recruiting from the traditional industry. A lot of it is inbound in a way that is, um, I, I, you know, for someone that's been in crypto for a long time is really validating. Mm -hmm. you no, know, we uh, and, how, and how talented are the people? Are they are these people that are coming in that are you're like wow this is incredible talent or are these people who are like you know uh, lower percentile performers in those other organizations and they want to come into crypto? No, no, no. The heads of departments, the heads of departments. Um, we we recently made an offer to uh, and and she's accepted and she'll become um, our new head of sales to the head of a department at uh, Euronext, which is a major stock exchange, right? Um, was was leading a number of initiatives there. Mm -hmm. um, we've um, we've been able to snag from traditional asset managers, traditional financial companies, country heads, like the person that was responsible for all of Southern Europe, the person that was responsible for all of Switzerland, all of Germany. Um, and again, a lot of this is inbound. A lot of this is inbound. We we have recruiters, and obviously we we try and, and seek other people. But what is surprising to me is. How many people are just interested in in this? How many people realize that the banking and financial system is broken? There is something wrong, and maybe we're onto something, and they want to be a part of it. Yeah. What's so fascinating to me is not only are you getting an increase in total talent right coming inbound, but also the quality of talent is still very high. And what I wonder is how many, how much of this uh, kind of talent leakage, right, or brain drain from the Wall Street firms becomes a threat. And all of a sudden they realize, hey, we're going to lose a ton of people if we don't start actually doing this as well. So there's kind of like an economic return uh, that is a incentive to get into it. But also there's this element of like, literally, if these people can't work on this stuff, they're going to leave. And therefore, we have to get into that business simply yeah. to retain our best talent. Yeah, I, I, I would argue that it's a part of a longer um, tech impact on finance in general. Like before there was crypto, people were leaving for Silicon Valley to do other things. And so I think the financial industry has had an issue retaining top talent for for quite some time. Um, the top people in America, at least, um, go to Silicon Valley. In my experience, a lot of people um, then, a lot of people in finance will then switch to Silicon Valley later. Um, and so I think that's, I think that's typically how um, how it's going. I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that there's um, another strategy that the banks can have besides embracing this mm -hmm. and to their credit and not every bank there's some there's some very bad um uh, there's some very bad people that should understand innovation more in the financial world but to their credit there are several top institutions who have been um quite early mavericks and i think it will lead to very good things for them right um a lot of the recent news coming out of uh, i don't know goldman sachs um, I think JP Morgan is doing some really interesting things. Um, some of the early market makers, like the the traditional guys, Susquehanna and Jane Street and Flow Traders, um, the fact that they were in crypto super, super early, like DRW owns Cumberland. That says a lot of great things about both of them. Yeah. And so I think um, the early adopters and the people that made big moves are going to be rewarded really handsomely. And the one last thing I, I would say on this and it's something that we in the industry should really embrace, it's completely fine to have skeptics that switch. This happened with JP Morgan and Jamie Dimon, right? And a lot of people will attack JP Morgan, say, you know, you've been against it for so long, you're acting hypocritical. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with admitting you're wrong and they should be fully embraced. I would love for, we're obsessed with Warren Buffett and, and, and Munger and what they think. I would love for them to switch their mind. And I'll, 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 I will hug them with open arms and welcome them to the tribe. You know, Changing your mind is a sign of intelligence, right? Exactly. That's fine. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in, I feel like it's like literally like a trillion dollar question in the industry right now, is all these institutions that are coming in, how much do they resemble the retail investors that came before them versus their new breed of investor? And what I mean by that is, um, you know, do they really have strong hands? 
or not. So one of the things is yeah. look at Bitcoin as a market structure, right? We know that 60% of Bitcoin or so hasn't moved in the last 12 months. We know that more and more uh, Bitcoin is coming off of exchanges on a daily basis, right? Mm -hmm. And so you basically have this uh, majority of Bitcoin that is held by quote unquote strong hands. People who they're not trading, they're not looking to sell regardless of price volatility up or down. Like they just, they hold for a long period of time. Institutions come in, and frankly, there's like two different arguments, right? There's one argument that says, oh, they're big institutions. They don't care about the volatility. They're going to hold very strong. Uh, whether the price goes up or down, they're not going to go and just dump all the um, you know, Bitcoin. They're doing this because they're in the industry, right? Like they, they had to go through a lot of pain and probably internal hurdles and, and bureaucracy to do it. So they're in. The other argument is Bitcoin drops 50% and the first people run into the door is Tesla and JP Morgan and you know Goldman and whoever, and they're just getting this thing off their balance sheet and like they actually are going to be the weakest hands in the room. Maybe the truth's somewhere in between there, but just how do you think about like institutions compared to uh, what to some degree is almost like a non-economic actor that has been the retail investors that have you know really kind of built this industry over the last uh, decade or so? Yeah, so I think we should um, specify a little bit. The umbrella term of institutional investors is too broad. If we compare family offices and ultra high net worth individuals who are, I would argue, the driving force of quote unquote institutional adoption in crypto today, they resemble a lot of retail mm -hmm. in many ways. It's a much larger check, mm -hmm. but it's sometimes driven by the same considerations. We're still not doing heavy investment committee meetings and the bureaucracy that's associated with it. Sometimes it can be driven by a single or a group, um, a single individual or a group. And largely the reasons that have attracted retail, and the, by the way, the reasons that have attracted early adopters like us, because I would argue we're, we're not quite retail or institutional, are the same. Um, a lot of people are concerned with the amount of money printing going on. A lot of people are concerned with the inflation or lack thereof. A lot of people are concerned about geopolitical risk. And family offices are usually based on an individual or a family, and they're equally concerned about the same things. And so I wouldn't worry too much about hands um, when it comes to ultra high net worth and family offices. And in our experience, they're pretty pretty damn strong hands. Um, the price sometimes dried rates in, in a wild and crazy fashion and they don't move. Oftentimes they buy more. And um, you know our, our, our first product was called HODL for a reason. And I, I, I think that that really translates one-to-one -one for them. On the trading side, we've started seeing um, some trading firms go in um, and they're very different. They're just a different breed. They're looking to make short-term profits, and they're and they're advertising it, um, right? They, they're not shy about it. That, that is what they do. Uh, but I would say that anyone who makes an investment in crypto, a meaningful one, in my experience, at least talking to European family offices, they're planning on 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 holding it in a similar uh, on a similar time horizon as a VC fund, as a being an LP in a VC fund, which you know, seven to ten years minimum, that kind of thing. Outside of what I'll call institutional, uh, we also have retail, institutional, corporates and countries feel yes. like the other two big thing that, you know, has happened. Yes, uh, yes, yes. I say that like over the last like two, three years, everyone was so focused on the institutional investors, we almost forgot about corporations, right? Like there wasn't a lot of talk over the last two, three years about the corporations. And sure, there are some people who had very great foresight and they wrote about it, you know, years ago or something, but that was not a mainstream narrative. Yeah. Michael Saylor. Elon Musk, Jack Dorsey, a few others Mavericks. Have, have completely changed that narrative. And now it's like every day, uh, the, uh, was it Mercado Libre in uh, Latin America, largest publicly traded company in, in that uh, region. Uh, they've now bought Bitcoin. Uh, you saw Metro Mile, which is a uh, kind of insurance tech company, recently came out and said not only did they buy Bitcoin for the balance sheet, they're now going to accept Bitcoin for premium payments. They're also going to do claim payouts in Bitcoin if you want that. And so you can just start to see, okay, like here come the corporations. Yeah. And then obviously we have countries, 
the nefarious or kind of malicious actors to, uh, from a U.S. Western world perspective of Venezuela, Iran, North Korea, etc. Uh, there's a lot of talk about things that they could potentially be doing with crypto, whether they're trying to mine it, buy it, hold it, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, but there's other countries that obviously are paying attention and they've publicly talked about it. What's kind of your read or experience with either the corporations or the countries? Are there things there that um, you've got like unique views on or or things that people just don't understand yet? Yeah. So I'm very, very, very excited about this. I think it's going to be absolutely phenomenal. I think it's so early. Like we're, we're happy that Elon and Jack and Michael are in. Uh, that's like three companies, right? There's 497 other companies just in that group of, of, of people that are absolutely not coming close to it um, at all. And, and, and it will be a while. But I think this is how it happens, slowly, slowly, then all at once. And the country stuff you bring up is super interesting because I think we need to saturate the... Uh, the, the sorry, the country stuff is super interesting. I think we need to saturate the companies a little bit more. It needs to be less of um, a huge statement um, for more companies to just have this as part of their normal portfolio composition, as part of their normal um, cash needs. Um, And then countries will follow. And they will follow first with sovereign wealth funds, which are more of private equity, venture capital investments, even if they're very um, long-term-minded. And then at some point, central banks. We've had very good conversations with certain central bank governors. Um, They're aware of it. Not yet. But in the same way that central banks hold gold, they will hold Bitcoin one day. Mm. Um, And I think countries will come. It will be a very big deal. But companies need to uh, be a little bit more saturated first. And it's super, super early for that. And by the way, if you're talking about like the big, big vision of Bitcoin, Everyone's talking about it replacing gold. If Bitcoin becomes the new reserve currency, like the crazy estimates that you know we read about of 10 to $30 million per coin, you need sovereign holders, you need corporate holders, and you need that to be standardized. So maybe that's a 10-year thing. I think that Bill Gates said it best. We overestimate what we can do in one year. We underestimate what we can do in 10. Uh, but I do think this could happen much, much faster than that. And I think that uh, Michael Saylor in the corporate world was like a perfect example. It almost feels like there's uh, the first one to break the seal. Yeah. Then you get the early adopters, right? You still don't get mass adoption. So to your point, 497 companies still haven't done it, right? But one led to three. And And it's no longer as big a deal. Yes, it normalizes a little bit. There's It's more of a conversation. There's literally CFOs and those other 497 companies are like, should we do this? They have to come up with a strategy somehow. Maybe Some we should go to a conference to and research. learn about it, right? Like, right, like there's all this stuff that happens. Countries are going to be the same way. And maybe it's one does it and then one other follows, yeah. right? And then it's just two and it's only two for a while. But I do feel like we're getting close to this point where uh, a country that is doing it not to get around sanctions, but is doing it from a pure financial benefit standpoint is going to embrace it. And when mm-hmm. that happens... I then think that uh, there's a kind of a fast follower, two, three, four, five, however many. Uh, the bigger thing that I've got confidence in, though, it's not going to be the United States. It's not going to be a major country, right? It's much easier for the smaller countries to go ahead and do this. Of course. And to essentially say, listen, this is my opportunity, right? If this thing is going to be real and this thing is going to have global importance, well, I can use speed to benefit in a more outsized way than those who have larger dollars, larger economies, you know, more kind of firepower from military standpoint, whatever. And so to me, it just is like kind of the mid-level and down. Somebody in that bucket is going to be able to uh, kind of get it together and do it. We're recording this in May of 2021. By the end of this year, I think we'll see it. I completely see that. And um, to be fair, my 10-year horizon is when it becomes ubiquitous. I think it will I think take. Fair. I think it will take ten years for it to become ubiquitous. Uh, but how long does it take the U.S.? You think the U.S. doesn't need to be first. That's the thing. That's the mm-hmm. thing that you know people don't realize. Uh, it's really hard to turn an oil tanker, uh, or I guess this is like a carnival cruise ship. You know, I was going to say, yeah, yeah. oil tankers more uh, much with bigger, four hundred million people on it, um, than it is to move a, uh, a small sailboat that will just turn on a dime, and 
the U.S. does not need to move fast. The U.S. needs to make sure that not everything breaks. And mm-hmm. that's that's a different consideration entirely, which is fine, which is completely fine. Uh, I agree with you. I think someone um, will do it this year. It will be a small country. And there's an opportunity. There's a huge opportunity for a number of countries to go in. Whoever what happened with Bulgaria? First... Don't they have 200,000 Bitcoins? Did they sell those? They claim that they sold them. They claim. sold them? <laughs> they claim. Who knows? Uh, the U.S. claims that they don't have any either anymore, right? Because they confiscated yeah, yeah, yeah. it, so they auctioned it off. Uh, maybe. I don't know. It, yeah. Look, it's, um, it's kind of like folks on Wall Street for a while. You just bought some just in case. We didn't tell anybody. And then all of a sudden, if it works, you're like, oh, I bought it back, you know, two years ago. I'll look at how smart I am. And if it didn't work, then you just don't tell anybody ever, right? And yeah, nobody yeah, knows. Yeah. And so, like, why take the reputation risk or the, uh, in this case, geopolitical risk mm-hmm. if you don't have to yet? It's like my guess is that some of these countries are already holding it, right? It's just who's the first to come out and say it. Yeah. Right? Because that's, like, another thing is if you separate out do the action from the announcement, like, the action's probably already happened in some of these countries. And it's going to be a, um, like, a national security thing to not hold it, I think. In, in a few years' time. And right? don't know when, but at some point, it will be prudent to hold this. Um, and you're starting to see some countries uh, trying to regulate mining more. Like, more mining hash power should come here. Or um, you can only use locally mined bitcoins. It's so that's crazy. But that says something about the national security apparatus thinking about this under the lens of national security. So from a sovereign central bank perspective... Yeah, they'll they'll hold it strategically. Forget economically, because I think countries are mostly driven by uh, surviving versus thriving, and there there's a there's a subtle but important difference. And so, if national security necessitates holding crypto, you're going to get a lot more holders than the economic opportunity. Agreed. But this whole idea of like uh, special Bitcoin is all bullshit, in my opinion. Of course, like green Bitcoin. Uh, my friend Kevin O'Leary, I keep giving him a hard time. He keeps talking about blood coin, right? Yeah, Meaning yeah. like, you know, Bitcoin that's not uh, um, mined with uh, renewable energy. Uh, now you're getting all sorts of, uh, I, I think my buddy Marty Bent said, uh, virtue signaling Bitcoin. Uh, Mark Cuban only buys like uh, freshly mined Bitcoin, allegedly. Something. Yeah. Uh, locally mined Bitcoin, yes. right? I mean, there's all these little things that people are trying to do. Trying it's to create a Whole Foods for Bitcoin. It's all know. nonsense. This is organic. Right? There's 21 million Bitcoin. <laughs> if I have a Bitcoin, you have a Bitcoin, and literally we trade them, yep. <laughs> and now I still have a Bitcoin, you have a Bitcoin, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. It's just like dollars, right? Imagine if somebody said, you know what, I'm only going to take dollars that are freshly pointed from the Federal Reserve, right? Or I'm only going to get dollars that have uh, been held by one person. Yeah. Now, technology is not there to do it, obviously, so you couldn't do it. Here, you could actually track some of this stuff. But I just think that it's ridiculous and it almost feels more like uh, intellectual stimulation than any sort of actual real world uh, applicability. What do you think? I feel like for certain people, it's just another excuse. Like, oh, I'm not investing in this because um, renewable energy. And then you look at their stock portfolio and it's a bunch of coal powered companies and, you know, African mining uh, based corporations. Do you okay. want to know what I think somebody should do? What? I'm definitely going to get in trouble with Polina for saying this, but I'm going to say it anyways. So you know how it's okay, pe- just another day, right? <laughs> yeah, you, you know how uh, the media loves to write these articles all about um, the Bitcoin miners and yeah. how they consume so much power and like they're ruining the planet. I'm waiting for a Bitcoiner to write an article that says that the media, how many trees get cut down every year, so they can print their newspapers and magazines, and yeah. they're ruining the environment. Right. And kind of like, okay, hold on a second here. Like you fight fire with fire. Like you guys want to have these ridiculous, stupid articles. Like here come ours. I will take this back to our research team. (laughs) I'm literally going to run the numbers on this. You might see something soon. Right. Like think about it for a second. That's really interesting. We should shut down all of the newspapers and magazines because they cut down too many trees. Yeah. Like you're killing the environment. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you're, you're destroying the planet if you don't use a Kindle. Right? I, it, it's kind of crazy. Why do you guys still have this? So, like, the, it, it's almost to this degree of, like, it's an absurd argument. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's no scientific or mathematical, uh, like, ap- application that is used in this analysis. Like, literally, it's just like, look how much power they use. Let's compare it to countries. It's like, well, hold well, like on a the, second. The, the electric grid is also really hard to explain and to understand. And so, look at how much well, power the they dollar. use. It says nothing. 
It's yeah, let's do the dollar, right? Yeah, yeah. Or or how much electricity is used by the media organizations to just keep the lights on so that they can write articles. Yeah, yeah. Right? And you start to do all this stuff. And like what you realize is like, look, by the way, I'm not here claiming that Bitcoin doesn't use energy, right? But I do think that the context is really, really important. And on top of that, the, you know, what is it, 75% renewable energy or what? Like all these little details get left out of the story. And so I think that that's like the world we're headed to is whether it's, Hey, I have green Bitcoin or locally mined Bitcoin, uh, or I was used on energy efficient Bitcoin or, you know, what, whatever people come up with. It's all crazy. I do think, though, that this year we'll probably start seeing some ESG Bitcoin. And people will. Do you think it trades at a different price? Maybe. Like we're thinking about it. Really? Yeah. We get a, we get a ton of requests from. Um, so this is where I would differentiate between the two, right? Okay. I think there are certain people who are absolutely just vehemently against it and are looking for an additional excuse. And then I think there are people who are constrained by their fund mandate or their own rules or their country's rules from investing. Like a lot of a lot of listed um, products um, in, in certain countries are unable to buy Bitcoin. One of one of why? the reasons why because of local oh, just regulations, oh, okay. just local yeah. regulations. One of the reasons why we've been successful is that we've come in and we've securitized it for fund managers whose mandates would otherwise preclude them from investing in physical. Because they can cryptos. invest in a fund, they can't buy exactly. Bitcoin directly. Exactly, and so off of that, I would be a proponent of if if you need an ESG. Um, entry point because of certain fund requirements that you have in Geneva, that's okay. Let me figure out some clean energy mines, get you in that way because you're ready to come in. Your rules just prohibit you from doing that. And I think we should differentiate between the two. Even though I agree with your bigger argument that over the long run, um, I think Bitcoin will be a huge, huge part of solving the climate crisis not yeah i think it's not the, the other i think right around. now it's probably the number one or one of the top r d drivers of renewable energy in the world in addition to that um carbon taxes which are actually the solution but no one is politically able to do it um bitcoin will be able to put an economic uh component to the energy grid and to clean energy and to global warming in a way that nothing else will so i think in the long run i agree with you Absolutely. And it will be clearer uh, the more time um, runs by. But in the short term, if I can do something to bring more people into the crypto ecosystem, let's do it. And by the, by the way, in a, in a, we have a product that does that already in, in, a, in a different way. So we have a Swiss product. We have a product that is an index of Bitcoin and Ethereum. Mm -hmm. That is in Swiss francs with Swiss custody, Swiss trading, um, Swiss everything, Swiss branding, two Swiss issuers. There's a certain set of people who will only want to invest in Swiss products. I don't know if you know this, but with gold ETFs, there are gold ETFs that are only Swiss gold, Swiss custody gold. And they charge a premium for that. And people are, feel more comfortable doing that. We've launched that product. It has tens of millions of dollars does in it. Does it trade at a premium? It does not trade at a premium. Maybe maybe these are good ideas from Pomp uh, that we should uh, incorporate. I'm not, I'm not saying uh, to trade <laughs> no, 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 at a no. premium. No, no, no. It doesn't trade at a premium. It trades at the same price as, as everything else. But s certainly the, these tens of millions of dollars that are in this product, it's just an index of Bitcoin and Ethereum, right? There are a lot of complementary products out there. Um, I'm glad we brought them in somehow. And I would do the same thing with ESG. I'd do the same thing with a few other things. But I think it's different when you're saying, hey, I need a Swiss uh, security. I need Swiss uh, you know, license. I need a Swiss exchange. I need a Swiss issuer or whatever. Those are all things are true, mm -hmm. right? They're, you're not going to convince me that a Bitcoin is different depending on where it was mined. But you're not the one that's being convinced. What, what you will have is you have a fund manager who's bullish who believes Bitcoin will replace gold, who believes all of that, and he wants it. And then his compliance department needs to tick the box on an ESG requirement. Mm -hmm. I would... But yeah. what I'm saying is, 
Uh, and I'm never going to talk to his compliance department. No, like, of course. I'm, not, I'm not having that conversation. Uh, what I'm saying, though, is it's a mirage, right? Because the Bitcoin yes. is the same either way. Yes. So what you're basically doing is, uh, if you think of it from a first principle standpoint, you're literally making up a whole charade to simply be able to buy it, which, fine, okay, if, if you acknowledge that. What I'm saying, the difference is, if you say, hey, I need a Swiss regulator, right, or a Swiss issuer, you go, it's either, it's true or false. Are they Swiss issuer, I yes think or it no? Becomes, I guess that's where I disagree with you. I think it becomes, it's a mirage over the medium and long term mm -hmm. as some of this stuff becomes clear and plays out. In the short term, it's a valid concern for someone that is legally and by regulation required to show everything that they invest in and, and its environmental output. And that's difficult to do if you're just buying Bitcoin on an agent exchange. I completely agree that it's difficult to do all the stuff. What I'm saying, though, is that's a uh, investor problem. That's not a Bitcoin problem. It's not a Bitcoin problem. Right. Because if that no, was no, no, the no. case. No, but if that was the case then they shouldn't hold dollars. I agree. I don't think it's a Bitcoin problem right. at all. But um, we should help those kinds of investors that want to come in but can't due to some handcuffs here or there. Change the rules. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you should all do right. both, bo both actively. I think that we can agree. Yeah. Um, what are you most excited about moving forward? Like next 12 months, what's the thing that you're like industry-wise, not necessarily for the company, because then you'll have to say things. <laughs> uh, no, we don't want me to say things. Um, hey, I, can you come on I, my yeah. podcast and not talk? Of course, of <laughs> course. Um, I think I have been really, really, really surprised by what has been going on with DeFi. And I think we talked about it actually the last time I was here very briefly. Like things are interesting there. Yeah, that has escalated mm -hmm. um, to a point where Uniswap now, on certain days, does more volume than Coinbase. I think uh, on an annualized basis, it's like a fourth. Of it's their, ridiculous. Yeah, their trading volume. Um, Sushi Swap came out of nowhere. Pancake Swap came out of nowhere. There's so much innovation. What, what in is this up space. with the names? What is up <laughs> with the names? It's good. Ethereum I like. I has, love it. I, Ethereum has more of a you know. Rainbow Kittens meme vibe about yeah, yeah. projects, and that's whatever it is. What it is. Whatever that, that is the community. <laughs> whatever it sticks. By the by, by the way, we have to do research on Sushi Swap and and explain that to people. Listen, if uh, I'm a huge believer that communities drive their culture, yeah, right. And if the community wants something, not only are they going to create it, but like, who is anybody outside of the community to judge, mm -hmm. right? So like the naming conventions, also like. To me, I'm like, how do they think of pancake swap, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, I'm like, by the way, is that that's what they want? Awesome. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Like, it's great. We, I have yet to have somebody come in here and have a conversation about this stuff and not start laughing as we talk about the names, which is almost part of the fun, right? Yeah. And, of, and if anything, it has infected the other uh, part. And so, Chef Nomi is the you know head of Sushi Swap. What's the CFO of Tesla's? Title again? Yeah. Right? Master of coin? Master of coin and right. te techno king Ex of Tesla. Exactly. And so I think it, it goes it goes both ways. But what's going on in DeFi is really early and really, really exciting. I'm, I'm confused a little bit still about NFTs. Um, I think that it's really exciting to see Bitcoin become so standardized. I, I, I think most people are starting to come around to the it, inevitable it, outcome of Bitcoin. I was going to say, is it a foregone conclusion at this point? It's close. It's close. Nobody ever wants to say it, but like, <laughs> I kind of feel like we're like, all it's right. It's close. Um, and I'm really excited about that. What are you excited about? Same stuff as always. Like to me, it's a foregone conclusion. It's been for a while, but uh, I think like really now, like uh, you have congressmen and senators with laser eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And mayors. You have mayors. We're right? sitting in Miami, right? You, you have uh, people who work at some of the most conservative organizations in the United States that are all accepting this, using it, buying it, holding it. Like, it's not going away. Yeah. And if it doesn't go away, the properties of the asset are going to continue to affect this like apex predator um, mechanism in the market that's going to continue to suck liquidity out of other assets. It's like one of the things that I think nobody's really talking about is when Bitcoin flips, gold is not happening at $10 trillion. No, no, not at all. It's happening at like $8 trillion, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And why? It's because Bitcoin is going to continue to grow, but also gold's market cap is going to contract. Like gold is a dying asset, which sounds nuts to people. But what we are watching is we are watching a new asset that is digital slay an analog asset. And 
some of it is causation, some of it's just pure correlation. But literally, as over the last six to eight months, Bitcoin has gone up 600%, gold is down. Yeah. But you know why it's not inevitable yet? Why? Bitcoin winning. Because I think it will be inevitable when you, as the manager of a treasury somewhere at a corporation, would have job risk of if you do not invest in crypto, where you could be fired if you do not have a crypto allocation, where it's that obvious. And you, but I think that that's already like in the inevitability, like that's already going to happen. It's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet, which is why I'm saying I don't think, I don't think today it, that's why I said we're close. We're not quite there. Because okay, if, that's if fair. yeah, you want more, uh, you, I want you, you have to more be, risk aversion than me. I want you to be <laughs> more, yeah. If, if you have a risk of getting fired from your job, if you don't invest in crypto, that's when we've won. Is there another asset where people have that risk? I mean, I, I like if you don't hold public equities, I guess like you're considered. Yeah, an but idiot. like if, if you're holding, if you're if if you're managing some portfolio or some treasury, and you're not, yeah, if you're not holding normal equities, equities that's, that's or dollars, pretty strange. right? If you're not like, using some sort of hedging mechanism in a basic way, like maybe people will question you. And if you yeah. don't, if you have zero allocation to crypto, maybe maybe then your sharp ratio is so wrong that clearly you don't know what you're yeah, talking you're not, about. You're not fulfilling your fiduciary something, duty. Something exactly. Yeah. All right. Where can we send people to find you on the internet? At Haney on Twitter is the best way. Did 20... we talk about last time how you got that handle? Just a very, very early Twitter you, user. You just went in and <laughs> typed it in and are like, whoop, let's go. Foreign name, very early Twitter user. Like All right. Winning combination. Uh, and then 21 shares and a moon? 21shares.com, A-M-U-N.com. Both dot coms. Yeah. 21 shares, nobody had. We, we're getting good names, right? Yeah. How did, 21 shares, nobody had? 21 shares we had to buy. Oh. Is there, a moon, is there a good I'm, I'm story? Egyptian. No, no, we 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 paid a really uh, a pretty High? low price for oh, it. low price, pretty okay. low price for it. I think it was a couple thousand bucks. Oh, all right, that's fine. Yeah. Should they should have taken a Bitcoin? Exactly, <laughs> they'd be in better exactly. shape. Exactly. All right, my friend, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. Always fun.